Previously on TFB TV, Alex took a look at an Austrian M95-30 short rifle, showed you how it worked, and took it out for a bit of a run and gun. Now on TFB TV, I'm Mike, and this is its predecessor, the original M1895 straight pull long rifle. Now these were introduced into Austro-Hungarian service in 1895 and they finally left the service in 1945. By that point they were serving with Bulgaria, all sorts of other countries. Uh, the Germans had them in inventory as uh, second choice weapons that they'd uh, taken over from Austria uh, uh, after Austria was uh, encouraged to join the Reich. Um, they also had Bulgarian ones in uh, both the earlier caliber and the later one. Now the one Alex showed was in the later 8x56 cartridge. Um, this is still in the original 8x50R, not to be confused with the French 8x50R, which is an entirely different beast. Now, uh, for the era, the cartridge was introduced in 1893 with the previous model, and uh, it fires a 240-ish, 245-ish grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second. It's a bit of a monster. Despite this incredible length, it's actually pretty well balanced and quite light and uh, I made up some cast lead bullets with about the same original bullet weight and uh, the original velocity and yeah they let you know about it. It is not a light shooting rifle. Now the Austrians liked it so much that uh, they went through an upgrade program in the 1930s to uprate them to uh, the M95-30 standard which is like the one Alex uh, fired in the earlier video. Now, uh, some were cut down into Stutzer short rifles. Uh, some were, well, they had a short rifle version of this and they were just rechambered. And we'll get on to just rechambering in a moment. Um, some of the original length ones are 8x56, and uh, you can tell because there's an S stamped on the receiver. This one isn't, this is in the original cartridge, uh, which makes life interesting for shooting because original ammo there isn't. No one loads it to my knowledge. There might be some custom ammo shops in the States that will load it for you, but uh, not here, even though we border Austria. Um, so anyway, it's actually pretty easy. Of all the cartridge conversions you can do, it's pretty easy. Uh, you've got two main choices. You can either take uh, once fired 762x54R from a Mosin, trim it, run it through a sizer, and then just load it and shoot it. That works brilliantly. Uh, you can take 8x56R, which you can sometimes find. Privy occasionally loads it, at which point you need to size it and trim it and uh, seat it and shoot it. Now, you might have a harder time with that simply because when you size down, you're making the brass around the neck thicker, so you might need to neck turn it or ream it. With the 762 by 54R it's thinner brass anyway. Uh, certainly, I've had no issues. And as for the bullets, about the only correct diameter bullets that you can uh, you can find are, at least I can find, is Privy 208 grains intended for 8x56R. And I'm sure there's people already tapping away saying, ah, but 8x50R uses a 323 bullet. And you'd be right, the bullet of the original ammo is 323, but the bore is about 330. And uh, this is one of the major misconceptions with this, and it, it gives us great difficulties with um, the die manufacturers because the die manufacturers make things to the common prejudices. Now, um, yes, the original bullets were 323. If you put a modern 323 Spitzer boat tail in it, it will be keyholing by 100 meters, pretty much guaranteed. I'm sure somebody's got a magic combination, they're tapping away in the comments saying, actually, it's uh, mine's fine. Um, great, you're lucky. Um, <laughs> basically, the bores on these are 330. The idea was that it was a big, long, heavy, round nose bullet. You give it a big kick up the backside with powder and it works like a hollow base. It's effectively a hollow base. It sets up and that's a long way to set up, 323 to 330. Um, you, you can't get the same setup effect with a boat tail because the back end of the, of the bullet isn't flat. So some of the pressure's working against you, it's working inwards. So it doesn't work. You are not gonna go over pressure. Um, I'm not gonna give you any load data, but uh, I had this out at 300 meters with uh, a load provided based on calculations from a uh, from the powder manufacturer and it was absolutely fine no high pressure nothing and the bore is 330 you can put 330 bullets down at 330 bore no problem right so back to the rifle straight pull meaning 
you don't lift the bolt, just pull it back. Cartridges come in a, an asymmetric on block clip. Excuse the horrible pink dummies. In they go. This won't feed five with those flat points. Schluck forward, clip release, off. Now as for the rest of the rifle, the sights, it's got a nasty pointy barley corn and V. Um, you've got sights graduated not in meters, but in Austro-Hungarian uh, Schritter, each one of them being all of 80 centimeters. Your lowest setting is actually up like that with the, uh, the leaf up. You've got 300 Schritter. Your next setting is with the leaf down. You've got uh, 500 and then 600 all the way up to 2600 on the, on the very, very top of the site there. This one positively locks unlike its successor. So uh, this is uh, pretty good. And I found that with the load I was using with these 208 grain bullets, with the sight down gave me a reasonable hold at 300. And how did it shoot? Actually very, very well indeed. Uh, once I'd worked out where to hold it, um, which was, uh, and what sight, what sight setting to have on it, because I, I was shooting something that's completely alien. Um, based on calculations, it was doing about 2,200 feet per second, so, uh, but a much lighter projectile. Um, got it on, had a reasonable hold for windage. It was, uh, it was perfect, held down a bit and shot what's actually a really nice group sling supported. I mean, I was pretty impressed. Now, uh, slight tangent, this same action was actually used by the Swiss and was adopted even before this because we have here a Swiss Model 1893 cavalry carbine. And this is basically the same action. There's a couple of minor, a couple of minor differences such as the bolt release, but this takes a detachable box magazine, classic Swiss style, and it takes a Swiss cardboard charger. These are dummies. Rather than an on-block load, like that. Now the Austrians loved these so much that as I said, they uprated them in the 1930s, uprated the cartridge, and uh, for the most simple conversions where the only thing that was changed was the sights and, uh, and the chambering, all they did was run a reamer into the chamber. Now, uh, 8x56R, it's a longer cartridge, shorter bullet, gives, a, gives basically the same overall length and uh, the shape of the shoulder. It basically, they leave the corner at the same point and then machine it longer taper to give a bit more case capacity. And those do 208 grains at 2400 feet per second, which is also a complete beast, as you can see from Alex's run and gun. What's interesting is that the Swiss hated this. I mean, absolutely detested it. Um, it was introduced and not very long later, they were looking for its replacement. Uh, and it's interesting how two different countries can have basically the same system and one loves it, one hates it. Um, the, the thing is here, part of it's to do with the, with the, with the setup, that it's a very short carbine. They weren't particularly accurate. The, the front sight's on the front band, it can wobble about a bit. But it's more to the point with um, uh, armoring, if there were any defects. Because what the Swiss also had in service was the 1889 Schmidt Rubin at the time. Uh, very easy to take the bolt apart. These, apparently, uh, cavalrymen would turn up uh, to uh, repeat courses on exercise with the bolt, bits of the bolt wrapped in a handkerchief because they couldn't get it back together. And it is a bit of a pain compared to the other ones. And the, uh, the, the other point is that um, a lot of minor repairs that could be done by un unit armorers on the Schmidt Rubin type rifles, these had to be sent back up the chain, sometimes even back to the factory. And uh, this, one's a, this one's a SIG Neuhausen. They're also made by Waffenfabrik Bern. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I find that kind of interesting. Now, from a user's perspective, the on block load, it seems to it seems to work more or less fine. Um, the bolt is kind of funky. Um, there's a, when it's out of the rifle, there's there's spring tension. It's not. I think it, technically it is cock on open, but the um, 
the striker's not back. What you've got in here is you, you've got the, sp uh, the spring is pulling the bolt head back and it's stopped with a little data on the extractor there. And uh, I'll very carefully put this back in. When you close it, what seems to happen is that you leave the, um, the striker on, on, the, on the sear and then that spring tension is transferred from the bolt head to the, to the striker in some slightly bizarre way. And I think that that's a little bit on the fiddly side. So it's sort of halfway house. It's not really quite cock and open. It's not quite cock and closing. It's this weird, weird thing where the spring tension shifted about. But from a user's perspective, there's quite a lot of rails that are probably not particularly dirt friendly. Um, but if you're being uncareful when, oh, there we go, perfect. Right, if you're not being careful, the bolt head will turn like that. I can imagine you're in the uh, Dolomites fighting the Italians in World War I. Uh, you're shooting corrosive ammunition, so you really, really need to clean your rifle. Uh, you've got, you're cold, you're wet, you're tired, you've got frozen fingers and that, and you can't, uh, I have to get my t-shirt dirty. And then you've got to wrestle your bolt head back into the open position like that. You've got, it's covered in grease anyway. And then, oh, and if you, oh, oh, got it in, got it in. But it's so easy just to knock. You never do it, well. there we go. Just knock it and, uh, and you're done. You've got to, oh, excuse me while Mr. Office fingers here faffs and fiddles with this thing. This may take some time. There we go. And then carefully back in. I think that's an issue. Um, the Schmidt Rubens with the external um, operating rod system, they're perfectly stable outside the rifle. There's no worry about that. They work totally differently to these. But uh, I think that was probably an issue in service, but it's quite fun. It's surprisingly accurate. Um, it balances well, it shoots well. The trigger's a bit mushy and doesn't break cleanly and is kind of heavy, but I mean, yeah, mass conscript armies, they didn't really mind about that sort of thing so much. So a couple of myths surrounding this rifle. Firstly, I've talked about it already. The bore diameter is not 323. It's just that the original bullets were deliberately undersized. Uh, second one is people make claims of massive claims of uh, rapidity of fire on them and no i mean compared to a sticky out bolt handle on a on a mosin or a or a gewehr 98 or a label or something like that yeah it's massively faster but uh, i mean the swiss straight pulls seem uh, a lot smoother they're a lot easier to work with and uh, lee enfield and mass 36s are much seem, seem to me to be much much quicker to operate um, but for the for the era, I mean, it's brilliant. 1895, you've got a semi pistol grip, you've got a straight pull rather than a bolt bolt handle in front of your face sort of thing going on. Now another persistent myth is a complete lack of primary extraction on these. But if you look at the bolt head, you'll see that the corners of the of the lugs are cut. There's camming surfaces. It does have primary extraction. It's on the bolt head. Now you can just, if you get the camera in at the right angle, you can just see the back of the bolt head move backwards as you pull it back. So primary extraction, yes. So there you go. I hope that was at least vaguely interesting. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Venturi Munitions, who helped to make this kind of content possible. Thanks to all our supporters on uh, TFP TV's Patreon page. Please like and subscribe to uh, TFP TV. Consider supporting us on Patreon if you haven't already done so. And uh, see you again sometime. Bye.